Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago. Over in Exodus chapter 15, we're looking at part 6 of Sing to the Lord. Exodus 15, our text is verses 1 through 21. The Song of Moses. Very, very important in Scripture because we find it here at the very beginning of the nation of Israel. We find it as God is culminating the things on earth in the book of Revelation. What we've seen thus far, very quickly, music plays a key role in the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's principally because God himself is a musical being and God himself sings. We saw that in Zephaniah 3.17. The Bible tells us that the devil is a musical being also. In both Isaiah and Ezekiel, we discover that he actually has musical organs built into his spirit body. We looked at the different words that are found in Ezekiel to tell us something about the instruments that are built into the devil's body. We learned about the pipes. We learned about the tabrets. We learned about some other kinds of instruments in the Old Testament. And the things that are built into Satan have some very key meanings. Not only is the devil musical, he's like a sharp cutting instrument. That's one of those words that's used. He's the sum of created beauty that God made. His name Lucifer means a light bearer, just like the one that is called the bezel reflects light. He punctures with violence. He's the originator and blasphemer and curse, cursor. Those are things that are all used in the musical instruments to describe Satan. We saw it's of great interest that he's like a sharp cutting instrument, a beautiful facet of a gemstone that catches and reflects light, and a root that means to puncture with violence or blaspheme. We also saw a key to our discussion in the New Testament. Paul also refers to pipes as musical instruments, 1 Corinthians 14, 7. Even things without life having giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it know what is piped or harp? And Paul is speaking in that context concerning the gift of tongues. Just like the speaking gifts, including tongues, they were to give an articulate, understandable biblical message in the language of the listener, and that's the purpose of musical instruments, even if there's no singing, because that's what Paul says here in verse chapter 14, verse 7 of 1 Corinthians. The musical instruments themselves can give clear instructions by what is played, a distinction in the sound. So the principles that we've learned so far, we've learned six basic principles. Number one, God ordained musical instruments to be used in divine worship. The issue of worship is key to the right kind of music. We're going to talk about worship this morning. That is very, very important when we get to the issue of what should music be used for by the Christian. In the Bible, we see instruments representing all three basic elements of music, melody, harmony, and rhythm. Second, We've seen that music is seen in Scripture as a vehicle for giving honor. And we saw that at least in one case, it caused jealousy in the heart of another person, Saul, who thought that he should have had the honor instead of David. That's honor, as we see, that can be given to man, resulting in jealousy in another man, or honor that can be given to God, resulting in jealousy from the devil, who wants the honor for himself. Third, music is seen in the Bible as a means of spiritual and emotional healing, even when the suffering comes from an evil spirit. Fourth, we've seen that having the right kind of instruments does not make it, therefore, correct music. The question is, for what purpose is the music being used? Israel was using all the correct instruments, but they still went into captivity. A talented musician, whether a great violinist or a rock star, can, with great clarity, express his worldview or the worldview of the composer who wrote the music. On the other hand, someone with a wrong worldview who performs music written by a composer with the right worldview can faithfully communicate the truth musically, just like a gifted pagan can read the Bible aloud with expressive power. What the church at large fails to understand, and you've heard me say this three times now, and I hope it sinks in, the church at large fails to understand generally is that a Christian with a Christian worldview who performs so-called Christian music that imitates the music of the world, music which is specifically designed to communicate a pagan worldview, is not, in fact, performing Christian music. Instead, he's confusing other Christians. Because they say, well, he's a Christian artist, so it must be okay. No, it's not okay, just because the guy's a Christian. We talked about what's called crossover music. We're not going to go into that again. Summary of point four, having the right kind of instruments does not therefore make the music right. The question is, and the word, the key word is legitimate. For what legitimate purpose is the music being used? And can this particular music to be used to honestly promote that legitimate purpose? You have to have both a legitimate means and a legitimate purpose. The end does not justify the means. The means and the purpose must both be legitimate. Fifth, 
The absence of music that glorifies God is a sign of judgment and desolation. We looked at many different passages that related to that. I hope to develop that theme when we get to the book of Revelation. We also saw that the absence of godly music during the judgment is one of the principal themes of Psalm 137. So remember point five, the absence of music that glorifies God is a sign of judgment and desolation. Now last week we added point number six. We began to look at the corollary truth. The objective purpose of music is to glorify God. And I emphasize the word objective. Music is not a subjective issue. Music is an objective issue. The objective purpose of music is to glorify God. If in some way the music does not glorify God and direct your thoughts to him, you need to question whether or not it is the right music. If it stimulates the flesh to carnal passion, it's not from God. Truly Christian music must glorify God. Paul exhorts, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. That includes your music. 1 Corinthians 10.31. I gave you a little bit of what I had preached down in uh, Mexico this past week for the uh, International Council of Christian Churches and the Alliance of Latin American Council Churches. Uh, and we'll cover a little bit of that today. But our key texts there were 1 Corinthians 10.31, do all to the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. In other words, we're the ones that are supposed to be doing it. It's by us, which means that the music that we perform, the music that we sing, the music that we compose, if you have that particular gift and abilities, I'm, I'm always amazed at Felix Mendelssohn. Between the ages of 12 and 14, he wrote 12 string symphonies. Incredible. Between the ages of 12 and 14. What have you been doing? <laughs> what have I been doing? Felix Mendelssohn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Felix Mendelssohn was a, a Bible-believing Christian uh, saved out of Judaism. Um, and uh, he truly used his music to glorify God. He really, really did. Uh, I didn't really un realize it until this past week. I was listening to the radio, and um, I heard some music by Fanny Mendelssohn. That was his sister. She was overshadowed by her brother. She was a homemaker, and her brother, um, of course, wrote most of the music that we know. But I heard a piano trio uh, that she wrote. It's in uh, three movements, and uh, piano, cello, and violin. She wrote over 600 pieces of music as a homemaker. <laughs> It's incredible. God gifted that family. I tell you, he certainly gifted that family with musical abilities for the glory of God. Well, anyway, uh, off of Mendelssohn, uh, objective purpose of music is to glorify God. Uh, we must in all that we do. We as Christians, it's to glorify God by us, 1 Corinthians 1.20. 2 Corinthians 4.15, uh, for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. We do it not only individually, that was back in chapter 1, verse 20, but we do it corporately in 2 Corinthians 4.15. That's why we sing at the worship services. We are corporately giving thanks and glory to God as we sing. Ephesians 3.21, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. In other words, it's not just for one local church at one particular time. It is going to be in the church, it says, throughout all ages. Do you realize that this is going to be a major part of our worship in heaven is singing? So start tuning up your vocal cords. <laughs> We're going to be singing in heaven throughout all ages, he says. Magnificent opportunity to bring glory to God. Music must glorify God. If it doesn't, it's the wrong music for you to be singing, performing, listening to. Don't do it. All creation will ultimately fulfill this purpose of giving glory to God through music. We saw that in Revelation chapter 4, verses 8 through 11, and chapter 5, verses 7 uh, through 14. And they're singing, it says, Every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are before them heard I sing, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Magnificent. Can you imagine the size of that choir. All the angels, all the redeemed from all the different periods of time, all gathered together around the throne, every creature on earth and in the sea and in heaven, singing and giving praise to God. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. I hope you understand the importance of music as far as God is concerned and why it's not something you can take for granted one way or the other. You must engage with it with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And in a way that glorifies God, not merely satisfies your own carnal lusts. Even pagans will ultimately fulfill the purpose of bowing before his glory, and none of their Baal worship music will be in heaven. We read that out of Romans 15, 9, Matthew 24, 30, 25, 31, and so on. So music and worship. I'm adding some new things here. I said, you know, music is part of worship. The principal purpose that God designed for music is worship. That is the principal purpose that God designed for music. It's not so that you can feel good about yourself, not so that you can get the warm wigglies. The principal purpose that God designed for music is worship. Now I'm going to say something that doesn't apply to all of you here, and even to some who are not here, but some of you are always late. And so you miss one of the principal elements of worship that God designed. Because we do all of our singing at the first part of the service. When you're habitually late, you're telling God that one of the principal elements of worship is not important to you. Those of you who show up late are usually 25 to 30 minutes late. And so it's time for a reality check. Those of you who work must be on the job somewhere between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. Morning worship doesn't start until 11 a.m. That's between two and four hours later than you have to be at work. If you were 30 minutes late for work every day, you'd get fired. That reveals something about your priorities. You honor your boss more highly than you honor God. You value your paycheck more highly than you value God's worship. Believe me, friends, someday you will stand before God and you will give an account of your slovenly attitude <laughs> toward worship. Believe me also, you know what? I'm going to give a testimony against you in that day. I'm going to give a testimony against you in that day. And for all your other wicked carnality. How do I know this? Because it says so in Hebrews chapter 13. There are two key verses, verse 7 and 17. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account. It's not just giving account for myself, listen to the rest of the verse. As they that must give account, that they may do it with joy, and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. I am going to testify against you. I won't have any option. I won't have any option. I have to give an account of everybody who ever sat under my ministry for the last 45 years or however long it's been. When you miss the part of the worship that deals with music, that which is sung by the choir, that which is sung by the congregation, that which prepares our hearts to come before God's throne of grace, Back to the issue of worship. I was recently reading the January-February issue of the Missionary Banner published by the Presbyterian Missionary Union, one of the Bible Presbyterian uh, mission groups. In it, there was a furlough update from Reverend Doug Lehman, who's a missionary to Brazil. One paragraph especially caught my attention. I'd like to read you that paragraph. This is Doug Lehman writing. While visiting churches, I usually presented our work during Sunday school, and then I was able to preach the word several times for the morning worship services. The general theme of each sermon was worship. Psalm 115, verse 8, in the context of idolatrous worship, teaches that you become like what you worship. And this truth is good news or bad news depending upon what you worship. If you worship the true and living God, you will become holy and just and wise as he is. If you worship idols, you will become deaf and blind and dumb, verses 4 through 7. All humans are inescapable worshipers, and worship is the key and most foundational defining reality for human life. That's a great sentence. All humans are inescapable worshipers. Worship is the key and most foundational defining reality 
for human life. God is worthy, and the beauty of his redeeming love constrains God's people to worship. Folks, since music is one of the principal elements of worship, the others being prayer, the Lord's table, and the proclamation of the word of God, we become like the music that we use in the worship of God. If it is carnal, we become carnal. If it is dull and repetitive, we become dull and repetitive. If it has no defining points, it just sort of fades in and just sort of fades out, like Hinduism. We still have no defining points, no solid touchstones in our lives that define or provide the rock and ground of our being. If the music stimulates our sin nature, our sin nature will control our so-called Christian life. If the music is trivial, we become trivial. You get the idea. We've discussed how this principle flows into all areas of life. For example, if we're covetous, God says we're idolaters. Colossians 3, 5 and Ephesians 5, 5. You heard me preach on that, so I won't go over it again. But money becomes our God. There are a lot of false gods available in the world. Music is one of the most powerful false gods available in the world today, along with money and sex and power. We don't just want to admit when we're worshiping a false god. We pretend that we're worshiping the true God with our music. We use all the right terms, we use all the right names, but in truth, we are like worshiping the golden calf because we insist on pagan music. There are two passages of scripture that deal with that. You know the first one, of course, which is when the children of Israel, while Moses was up on the mountain, made a golden calf. I want to read this to you because we have music mentioned in this passage. This is Exodus chapter 32, beginning in verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. Boy, talk about fickle people. He just delivered them from slavery. And already they're ready to forget him. You know, that's true in many churches. They're ready to forget the pastors that did stuff for them. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings that were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them with their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now, wait a minute. The golden calf with the sun disk between its horns was one of the gods of Egypt. Is that the God that delivered them across the Red Sea and drowned Pharaoh's army? I don't think so. How quickly people forget. But they called him God. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation. This guy is guilty. Is he culpable? You bet he is. Although he's going to try to get out of it a little bit later. And said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D. That's the name Jehovah. He's calling the golden calf Jehovah. Just because he called it Jehovah, did that make it Jehovah? Did it? Yes or no? No. Okay. Uh, At least you're with me still. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat, drink, and rose up to play. Paul quotes that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 where he says God killed a whole bunch of them. He says, don't be like that. He uses this specific illustration to tell us not to be like that. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? God says to Moses, They're your people, and you brought them out of the land of Egypt. In other words, Moses, I'm going to hold you accountable for how you handled this situation. God is clearly the one who brought them out. Moses couldn't have done that by himself. But God holds Moses accountable for what they're doing. Holds me accountable for what you're doing, too. That's why I have to preach like I do. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Does God hear everything that we say? Yes, he sure does. God knew what they were saying down there, even though Moses couldn't hear it. God just reported what they just said. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, and that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. Now most of us would have said, sounds like a plan, Lord. (laughs) Kill them all, turn me into a great nation. It's a lot easier to take care of my own family than it is to take care of six million Jews. 
Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them. I'll make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought to his Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Moses gives the credit to God. Therefore should, wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath. Repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, that they shall inherit it forever. It's always good to quote God's word back to him. God always keeps his word. The promises of God are yea and amen. The promises of God are true and absolute altogether forever. Moses is reminding God, and you can do this too, of what God promised in his word. Because God never breaks his word. All the land that I have spoken of will I give to your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Moses' prayer saved the Jews from destruction that day. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. On the one side and on the other they were written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the table. God, remember, had carved those letters in the stones with his own finger. The tables were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, Moses coming down with Joshua, as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there's noise of a war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is the voice of them that cry for being overcome. Now listen to the next phrase. We're in verse 18, if you're looking at Exodus 32. But the noise of them that sing do I hear. Do you think God was pleased with the music they were singing? They were having a good old time, and they were singing, and they were singing about deliverance from Egypt, and they were saying, this is the Lord, this golden calf. They're singing to the golden calf. Do you think God was pleased with that? No, no is exactly right. God was not pleased because they were using pagan worship music. Be careful. Did you get that? They thought they were singing to Jehovah, but they had a false God. Verse 19. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh to the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. Was Moses mad? <laughs> I think so. And, well, he had the right to be mad about it. Because the people of God were sinning. Sometimes I get upset with y'all because I see there is sin in the camp. And he took the calf. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? Now listen to Aaron's excuse. We already know what really happened because it says so in the first part of the passage. But Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. Right, okay. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And I said unto them. So he's giving some of the details right, but listen to how he changes it. You know, we do that a lot. We, we go through a bunch of facts and details that are more or less right, but then we change it so that we're not culpable, so that we're not guilty. Listen to what he says. I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me. Then I cast it in the fire, and there came out this calf. Now, wait a minute. That's not what it said back there, was it? It says he made a molten calf, and then he carved it with an engraving tool. That's not throwing the gold into the fire and having it come out as a calf. He's not innocent although he's trying to be innocent. And when Moses saw the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies. That kind of music and that kind of worship 
motivates you to sin. Do you get it? Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. Go kill the sinners. Do you get it? In the middle of a nice, pleasant time of singing music, huh? Wrong music, wrong worship. Calling it God does not make it from God. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. The Levites killed 3,000 men who'd been worshiping the golden calf. Do you think God was not happy with what those people in Israel were doing? And he was very pleased with what the Levites did. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord, peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. You know, there are a lot of Americans who've made them gods of gold. It's called covetousness. It's called going after money. For them, the money is the big thing. Covetousness is idolatry, and the covetous man is an idolater. Colossians 3 5, Ephesians 5 5. They made them gods of gold, so do some people, maybe somebody here in this church. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee out of thy book which thou hast written. Moses was willing to take the punishment for the sins of the other people. You know, that's what Jesus did for you. He took the punishment for your sins. Moses had the same willingness to die for the sins of all the people. Actually, to give up his salvation, he says, blot me out of the book which you have written. Would you do that for even the person you love the most, give up your eternal salvation? If you could, you can't. But if you could, would you, would you be willing to do it? Moses is a unique man in Scripture. God prepared him. God called him. God guided him. God empowered him. God led him. And even then, the people finally got under his skin and he violated one of God's commands, and so God said, you'll see the land, but you won't go in. You're going to die here on Mount Nebo. Little things make a difference with God. Well, I don't have time on that one today, but let's keep on moving here. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. Now you know that wasn't the only golden calf in the history of Israel. That wasn't the only one. Did you know there were two more? Two more golden calves in the history of Israel, much later period of history. Both of them existed at the same time. You know, men are determined to worship something that they can see and that makes them feel good, that stimulates their senses like carnal music. This is over in 1 Kings chapter 12, beginning in verse 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. Remember, the kingdom is split here. And Jeroboam's word that the northern tribes are going to go back because they have to go to Jerusalem three times a year uh, to the feasts of the Lord. And then they'll say, Man, we really need to get back together with the southern kingdom, which was the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. The other ten tribes had gone off to the north with Jeroboam. So Jeroboam's worried about that. And he says, if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of the people turn again to their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Now, is he thinking about the good of the people or is he thinking about his own skin? His own skin, you're right. He's worried about his own skin. You know, a lot of stuff that people do, including in politics, we have politicians doing this right here in this passage. He's a politician. <laughs> they do stuff for their own skin, not for the good of the people. 
Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, that is, he said unto the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. What's he appealing to? One of the seven deadly sins, the sin of sloth. He's appealing to their old sin nature. Look, it's a long trip to Jerusalem. I mean, do you want to go all the way from northern Israel all the way down to Jerusalem? You know that's a long road. You know there are robbers along that road. You know that you know, you got to pay money to stay in inns as you're going along that road. Why bother? I tell you what, I'll put a calf in the southern part of the kingdom so that you guys can, who are in the southern part can go see that one. And for those of you who live up in the north, I'll put another one up here in Dan. That was a northern tribe. Uh, and you can go up there uh, to worship. He's appealing to their carnal nature. Do you know what music does that too? The golden calf. It's too much for you to go up in Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now you think they would have learned by now what happened with the first golden calf, which did not bring them up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan, and he made a house of high places, and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. He put unqualified people in the positions of religious leadership. You know, there's a lot of so-called churches today that have unqualified people in positions of leadership. God isn't very happy with that. Of the lowest of the people, and Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar, he did, so did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even the month in which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. And he says, a feast unto the Lord. Just because you say it doesn't make it so. I hope you understand that. Just because you say this is Christian music doesn't make it so. You know, I, every now and then I get the uncomfortable feeling that some of you don't have the foggiest idea about the holiness of God. The holiness of God. We're worshiping the holy, living God who is both creator and judge of all the earth. So you had better make sure that your worship is holy. And that means you'd better make sure that your music is holy, not just borderline. So how does the requirement of doing all for the glory of God specifically apply to music? We began looking at that aspect last week, the glory of God being one of the grandest themes in Scripture, and it applies to music. Indeed, all of creation was made by our Creator to give Him praise, honor, and glory, and someday God has prophetically guaranteed that it will do so. In what I've called the heart-pounding, knee-rattling, awe-inspiring throne room vision of Revelation 4, Christ appears on his throne of glory, and we hear the voice of the 24 elders roaring out a paean of praise. And the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. All things, that means music, is included in the list of all things. That's a magnificent scene to open the heavenly courts of eternity given to us in Revelation 4 and portrays the glory of God. Whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. It's a brief text, but it has intense obligations that affect every area of our lives. It affects the ordinary things like eating and drinking. He says so in the verse, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. So what you eat and what you drink can't be neutral. Definitely not negative. It has to be for the glory of God. It says so in the verse. It specifically is eating and drinking. It affects the ordinary things, the heroic things. It affects the hard things, the easy things. It's a challenge to courage and stamina. It's a call to rely on divine strength and guidance. It's a command to put ourselves second and to put God first. That means putting music that glorifies God first and putting music that satisfies our flesh second. It's the obligation to develop the divine order of priorities. And we talked about some of the things that the glory of God covers. I'm just going to read that very briefly for you. You heard this last week, but I want to read it again. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. 
That affects our scheduled activities and our unscheduled crisis times in life. It affects our chosen actions and our reactions when we are taken by surprise. It causes us to assess the temporal nature of life. It gives us focus to make the most beneficial choices and always to choose the best over the good. It affects all of the conscious choices that we make in life and the habits that we specifically and knowingly develop. It affects our involuntary and unconscious habits. It challenges us to sit up and reevaluate our purposes and our goals. It sometimes causes us to change our life direction. It sometimes directs us to enter into a different door than the one we thought we should take. It demands that we eliminate the unnecessary and trivial things in life. It causes us to focus on the things of heaven rather than on the things on earth. It causes us to look both through the telescope of the future and the microscope of our present life. It causes us to act on the basis of eternity where things last forever rather than on the basis of time where it all passes away. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That challenges us to assess our time and its use. It confines and at the same time expands what we can legitimately do with fleeting minutes and resources that God has entrusted to our care. It determines the nature and timing of our relationships. It determines the depth of our relationships. Is it to the glory of God? It determines the length of the relationship and whether we should bring a relationship to a close, no matter how painful. It may cause us to deepen a relationship if it will make us more effective in glorifying God. It determines the specific group of people that we choose to develop into friends. It determines our choice of a life partner and the timing of entering into marriage. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That command determines what we provide for our families, what we allow them to do, and the choices we make for those under our authority. It engages us in our education, occupations, hobbies, free time, activities, entertainment, and responsibilities. It determines what we do in public and what we do in secret. It determines the legitimate and illegitimate exercise of authority. It teaches us submission to higher authority. It teaches us when, where, how, and what, and to whom to give, and from whom to withhold our giving. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's a commandment that teaches us to act like Jesus, to study him so that we know how to move in a sinful world without being polluted by it. It teaches us to seek wisdom, which is the principal thing. It teaches us to read and study the scripture. It requires us to learn the specific facts of scripture that we might understand God and his will for our lives better. It teaches us to learn the Bible's commands and prohibitions, its principles and its priorities, so that we can maximize the glory of God in our interactions with the world around us. It teaches us to pray, how to pray, how to persevere in prayer, the request to make and the request not to make, when to pray, for whom to pray and for whom not to pray. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. It teaches us how to interact with other people, both with the lost and with brothers and sisters in Christ. It teaches us how to stand against apostasy. It teaches us how to be compassionate and how to... Uh, and to whom to be compassionate, and when to be compassionate. It teaches us how to fight the spiritual warfare. It teaches us to be valiant. It teaches us to live or die for Christ, but never to compromise. It teaches us to be unashamed of the gospel of Christ. It teaches us to witness. It teaches us to be courageous enough to confront a sinning brother in love and humility. It teaches us the meaning of sacrifice. It teaches us to die to self, do all to the glory of God. It teaches us to earnestly seek the will of God. It teaches us to put the will of God before our own will. It teaches us to defer to others and to exercise Christian charity. That brings us to some more new material. Let me begin by asking a couple of questions. First, can a good musician compose and play both good and bad music? A good musician, can he compose and play both good and bad music? And the answer is, of course. That's like asking, can a preacher preach both the truth of Scripture and sometimes preach false doctrine? Of course. Zealous, truly saved Armenians fall into that camp when they deny the sovereignty of God. But they're saved. That's why you must be like the Bereans. They compared what even Paul taught with the Scriptures. God himself said that was one thing that made them better than the church at Thessalonica. Acts 17.11 these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word of God, the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. More noble than the church at Thessalonica. That's God's commendation of the church at Berea. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. 
Ah, yes, there's more. Doing all for the glory of God affects not only our overt actions, but it also affects the things we choose to avoid and refrain from doing. It affects not only our personal speech, but to whom we speak, where we speak, when we speak, the content of our speech, the tone and intensity of our speech, the volume of our speech, the expressions and body language that we exhibit when we're speaking, the words we choose to use in each context, the avoidance of words and terms that reveal the flesh, the words that would uncover the seven deadly sins in our lives of anger, pride, envy, lust, sloth, gluttony, and greed. It informs and controls the minimal times when we actually refrain from speaking for the right reasons. That doesn't happen very often with most of us. We always got to say something. When we do all for the glory of God, that is an objective standard, not a subjective standard. And that means it applies to music. They're objective standards. You know, God never gives subjective standards. With God, everything is either light or darkness, black or white. There are no shades of gray with God. Everything is either sin or it is righteous. Did you know that? I know you know that. You've heard me say it. Whether it's sunk in, I don't know. Did you know that's one of the main themes of 1 John? There are no shades of gray with God. It's either righteous or it's sin. Those are your only options. Like there are only two options for eternity, heaven or hell. You have no other options. That's why you're in such difficult straits if you think you're going to make it to heaven by having your good works outweigh your bad works. 51% versus 49%. With God, if it's not for his glory, it is sin. Did you get that? With God, if it's not for his glory, it is sin. Because if it's not for his glory, it's for somebody else's glory. It's for the glory of the devil, or the glory of the world, or the glory of the flesh, or your personal glory. If it's not for the glory of God, it's sin. That should make us pause and think about that humongous long list of all the different things, and I'm sure there are more. I spent a long time thinking about all the different ways in which this would apply. That means that he has an objective standards for the elements of worship, including music. Let me put it this way. God will not permit strange fire on his altar, which is the center of his worship. I'm going to read to you from Leviticus chapter 10. We find this incident mentioned three times in the Old Testament. When God says something three times in the Bible, it's because he wants us to get the point. Leviticus 10, verse 1. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense upon it, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Were they qualified? Yes, they were qualified. They were the sons of Aaron. Had they been given some of the jobs around the tabernacle? Yes, they had been given some jobs around the tabernacle. Did they on occasion get to offer incense before the Lord? Yes, on occasion they did. But when they did what he did not command them to do, listen what happens. And there went out a fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. You think God is concerned about the way in which we worship him? Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And listen to the next phrase. Here we're talking about the glory of God. And before all the people, I will be glorified. You can't just do it sua sponte, which means on your own motion. You can't just do it because you feel like doing it. And Aaron held his peace. Two of his sons, his two oldest boys, had just gotten killed. And Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said unto Aaron and unto Eliezer and unto Ithamar, those are the other two sons, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes. You can't even mourn the death of your sons and brethren. Neither rend your clothes, lest you die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. That same incident is mentioned over in Numbers 3. Verse 3, these are the names of the sons of Aaron, the priests, which were anointed, whom he consecrated to minister in the priest's office. And Nadab and Abihu died before the Lord when they offered strange fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai, and they had no children. And Eliezer and Ithamar ministered in the priest's office in the sight of Aaron, their father. 
brought back to that what God does to those who worship him in a way that he has not ordained. Numbers 26.60 And unto Aaron was born Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. And Nadab and Abihu died when they offered strange fire before the Lord. I hope you get the point. God wants us to pay attention to the principles that he's trying to teach us. Remember I just read in Leviticus 12, 3, and before all the people I will be glorified. You say, but it doesn't say, thou shalt not use rock music in the Bible. You know, that reminds me very much of um, the moronic, sophomoric, sophomoric by the sophomore, uh, that means wise fool. Second year of college are called sophomores. They're the wise fools. They think they know everything. Um, but the moronic uh, kind of arguments that I heard in college where some of my classmates would say to me, they're sneaking out to smoke. They say, but the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not smoke. Show me a verse where it says the Bible says thou shalt not smoke. Well, you don't have to show them a verse where it says thou shalt not smoke because God has laid down certain very important principles. One of which is your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. If anybody destroys the temple of the Spirit of God, God will destroy him. And that's what happens to smokers. God destroys them. You know, there are many passages in scriptures. Don't cause a weaker brother to stumble. You think children are weaker brothers? Yes. Do kids get hooked on cigarettes when they're 8, 9, 10 years old? Yes. I saw that back when I was a kid. Little kids smoking cigarettes behind the barns. It doesn't have to say, thou shalt not do this or that. God didn't give us an entire list of all the things we shouldn't do. But he's taught us principles that we can apply to every area of life. And the strange fire in worship applies to music. I can't believe our time is already up. Well, anyway. Whatsoever you do to all to the glory of God, there's an even deeper level. The glory of God is the standard for what we're allowed to think. And the times we're allowed to think those thoughts. It prohibits certain thoughts. It commands certain thoughts. It organizes and categorizes our thoughts. When we commit our works unto the Lord, he establishes our thoughts. Doing all for the glory of God moderates and tempers our thoughts. It releases certain thoughts in the expressive modes of our speech and actions at precise points in time. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. On this deeper level, a focus on the glory of God also determines our attitudes. Even when we're not speaking or acting, it mandates that we must have the divine viewpoint on all the events and people and circumstances of life. It forms our worldview. It determines our willingness to avoid the appearance of evil. It monitors whether we're causing a weaker brother to stumble. It thus determines what we wear. You know, there's no place in the Bible that says, Thou shalt not wear a miniskirt. But it teaches you principles of modesty. Doing all for the glory of God will determine what we wear, how we wear it, the times in which we wear it. It doesn't say, thou shalt not wear pajamas, because you wear pajamas when you go to bed, but you don't wear pajamas out in public, do you? The places in which we wear it, the kind of music we listen to, the forms of music we focus on and allow to shape our personalities, the sensual or spiritual nature of our music. It determines how we choose to avoid the appearance of evil in the places that we go and the people with whom we enter those places. It makes us sensitive to our culture and maintenance of our Christian testimony, both to the lost and to the believers. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. I still have three more paragraphs of that, but I'm not going to do it this week. We'll cover that next week. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your power and for the power of your word. Teach us that you are a holy God. Teach us that worship includes music. And all that we do must be to the glory of God, even when we're not meeting together with the church. We're to glorify you both individually, as we've seen in Romans, and also corporately, as we've seen in 2 Corinthians. That means it includes the kind of music that we listen to, the kind of music we sing, the kind of music that we play. Father, help us to do all to the glory of God. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for this morning.